thank you very much, uh, Bruno, um, Excellency, Deputy Secretary General, um, fellow panelists, colleagues, friends. Good afternoon. I would like to thank as well, especially Executive Secretary Alicia Basena for the invitation to participate on this panel and especially for the seating arrangements because I believe seated at the far left of uh, Bruno and Jorge is ideologically correct in my sense. The issue of multilateralism, the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda and, and the role of ECLAC are deeply interrelated topics that individually and collectively are central to the developmental aspirations of our region. The challenges and opportunities inherent in these topics, therefore, have direct bearing on where we are today and the path we take to our 2030 objectives. Multilateralism is built into the Sustainable Development Goals. Goal 17 of the SDGs is entitled Revitalize the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development. Similarly, this multilateral global partnership for development was found in Goal 8 of the predecessor Millennium Development Goals. However, the targets of Goal 17 of the SDGs seem destined to be relegated to the back burner amid a palpable retreat from multilateralism in cities across the globe. Major powers are reneging on multilateral accords on climate change, nuclear non-proliferation, and hemispheric trade. They are cutting hundreds of millions of dollars of funding to multilateral development agencies. Elsewhere, countries are withdrawing from long-standing multilateral integration arrangements, and a xenophobic, jingoistic hostility to multilateral action is taking hold across the developed world. This rise in doctrines of withdrawal and rejection has placed multilateralism under threat at precisely the time when it is most urgently needed. An iniquitous system of globalization, which has done more to concentrate wealth in the hands of the richest than it has done to create or redistribute wealth to the poorest, has undoubtedly played a role in the retreat from the hitherto unquestioned logic of multilateral engagement. Within our region, these global tensions and uncertainties are taking root in Latin American and Caribbean capitals, and a new spirit of interventionism and interference is threatening the bedrock principles of self-determination and mutual respect upon which multilateralism is built and fortified. This 37th session of ECLAC has focused a great deal on inequality, and I commend Executive Secretary Alicia Basena for her excellent work in coordinating the comprehensive inefficiency of inequality document that was presented this week. The document makes a compelling case that there is an economic and developmental cost to inequality of means, opportunities, capacities, and recognition. As the pace of globalization has gathered, so too has the level of inequality accelerated beyond academic talking point and become a serious and unsustainable drag on development. Uh, my sister uh, Maria Fernandez mentioned uh, the, the issue of the yawning inequality gap between the richest 1% and, and, the, and the poorest. And indeed, in 1970, the richest 1% of the world's population owned 8% of global wealth. Today, the richest 1% owns almost half of global wealth and are on track to own two-thirds by the year 2030. If income distribution more closely resembled the ratio of the late 70s and early 80s, over $1 trillion more would be going towards the bottom 80%, increasing that segment of the population's income by over 25%. However, while this week we have discussed in great detail inequalities that exist within individual national borders, 
We have made only passing reference to the inequalities that exist among and between states in our region, regional and global family. It is these global inequalities that often fuel local inequality, and it is these global inequalities that can only be addressed through concerted multilateral action. For small island developing states, these global inequalities have calcified into an international architecture that, focus, that forces us to climb up the down escalator developmentally. Whether it is a laissez-faire attitude to climate change mitigation, or the insufficient resources for adaptation, or the ever-moving goalposts of financial sector compliance that disproportionately subject island economies to an endless stream of blacklists and gray lists and uncertainty, or the iniquitous application of global trade rules that fail to consider the context or limited production of small island economies to their detriment, or a multilateral system that is unable or unwilling to, un to arrest unilateral economic blockades and embargoes against island states, or which turns a blind eye to attempts to foment political unrest or regime change, or whether it is the disconnection of island states from the arteries of global trade and commerce through arbitrary de-risking practices and the loss of correspondent banking relationships, or whether it is the draconian anti-migrant policies that infringe on human rights as well as place additional economic burdens on migrants who attempt, uh, who attempt to send remittances home, or the imposition of a one-size-fits-all structural adjustment program that are insensitive to and uninformed about the unique specificities of island societies and economies, or mounting debt often fueled by disaster response and climate resilience measures that is exacerbated by arbitrary delineations based on per capita GDP, a metric that borders on meaningless in the context of island microstates, and Rodolfo mentioned this issue as well. Caribbean, and indeed many other Latin American countries, have suffered the unholy trinity of being globalized, climatized, and stigmatized to varying harmful degrees. This trinity of anti-island action has produced some cruel economic paradoxes, including the fact that the smallest contributors to climate change are the most affected, the lowest contributors to terrorist financing and banking impropriety are the most constrained, and, and I listened with great interest to both Maria Fernanda and uh, Her Excellency the Deputy Secretary General talking about tax reform and tax transparency, and it's important but it's also important that we don't use a machete when a scalpel will do uh, in our regulations because the global crises that, have been, that we have endured were not founded on tax avoidance in the Caribbean or tax avoidance in Panama, but it was founded on Lehman Brothers and their actions and Bernie Madoff and his actions. And we have to be careful that the actions we take are fit for purpose. And, and not uh, a one-size-fits-all action. And there is the paradox that the smallest producers of global goods and services are the most impacted uh, by WTO rules. There is the fact that the most indebted among us are the least likely to get debt relief or concessional financing. I, I mention also the fact raised by uh, my brother Pernell Charles from Jamaica that those of us in the Caribbean who produce neither one gun, nor one bullet, nor one ounce of cocaine are the ones most affected by the transit of these drugs from north to south, drugs and guns. And when we act and risk our lives in our Coast Guard services in the Bahamas or in Jamaica to intercept and interdict drugs that are not destined for our borders, but are destined for others, we are committing an act of solidarity and multilateralism, um, but the cost of this crime fighting is disproportionately affecting our island states when the option could be to be like a matador and, and wave them through uh, to their destination. We have to make a determination in ECLAC whether or not small island states will be forever consigned to the periphery of the periphery, seeking cracks and loopholes in the financial architecture from which we extract a, a fleeting global rent 
we must do more than say one size fits all. We must acknowledge and accommodate and plan for the unique specificities of island economies and island societies. These global problems require global, that is to say multilateral solutions. The fundamental wellspring of equitable multilateralism is mutual respect and a willingness to eschew short-term responses in favor of lasting long-term solutions. In our regional context, multilateralism and solidarity are two indivisible sides of the same coin. At its core, multilateralism requires solidarity with developing countries, sharing the burden of investing in global public goods, and an acceptance that collective responses require multilateral actors to respond in accordance with their means and their responsibility. Within ECLAC, multilateralism does not mean a division of responsibility along the traditional north-south lines, but rather an acceptance that all have ideas, resources, support, and expertise to share with each other in pursuit of our shared objectives. And Cuba has been a beacon and an example of solidarity and as President Diaz-Canel said in the opening, uh, giving of what he has, of what they have, not what they have in excess. And, and this is a lesson that we all can learn in solidarity. The benefit of modern multilateralism is not that it enables a group of countries to collectively analyze a problem, but that it enables and arrives at collective creative solutions to problems that are preferable to individual or unilateral actions. Integral to this solutions-based approach to multilateralism is the recognition that the cost of global public goods is high and the burden of investing in them must be shared broadly and equitably. In agreeing to the Sustainable Development Goals and setting forth the 2030 Agenda, we have to date done little more than analyze our modern developmental challenges and identify the global public goods that require investment. Difficult as that process was, from the perspective of multilateral diplomacy, it was the easy part of the 2030 Agenda. The hard part is and will be paying for it. Let us make no mistake. In agreeing to the 2030 Agenda, we have committed to an extensive and expensive multilateral course of action. Financing the SDGs is estimated to cost up to $2.5 trillion annually to fully realize the Agenda. Additionally, separate pledges of $100 billion per year in climate finance, first agreed in Copenhagen in 2009 and reiterated in Paris uh, three years ago, those pledges remain more mirage than reality. There is no amount of policy prescription or accounting sleight of hand that can get us around the fact that massive amounts of new and additional resources are needed to achieve our internationally agreed climate security and developmental targets. The yawning chasm between our present reality and our 2030 goals cannot be bridged by good intentions or kind words. They can only be bridged by a massive injection of new resources. The availability of those resources, in turn, will be the true test of the developed partners' tangible commitment to modern multilateralism. Indeed, it is the effectiveness of these investments in regional and global public goods that will determine whether the benefits of globalization can be more equitably distributed or if the current backlash against globalization will take root and undermine multilateralism itself. So what is the role of ECLAC? We have been celebrating ECLAC's 70 year anniversary at this meeting. And, and 70 years is, is a long time. It's, it's a lifetime. I think, I think the Bible says you get three score and ten um, before you have to perish. Um, but, of course, strictly speaking, ECLAC, in its current incarnation, is only 34 years old this year because the Caribbean was added to the Economic Commission of Latin America in 1984. Indeed, 70 years ago, none of the English-speaking Caribbean countries had yet achieved independence. In that sense, this week's discussion of a Caribbean first posture within ECLAC is a welcome act of historical redress, not only in recognition of the colonial calendar, 
but within an organization that during its formative years, through no fault of its own, um, and for more than half of its life, was deprived of a large Caribbean perspective. As ECLAC has evolved as an organization, so too must its mission necessarily reflect the changing global environment. The superb academic and analytical rigor of ECLAC and its role in shaping the post-colonial developmental discourse must now be brought to bear at a time of waning global solidarity and endangered multilateralism. Accordingly, greater attention must be paid to ECLAC's existing advocacy and solidarity mandates, which include, this is from their own document, promoting economic and social development through regional and sub-regional cooperation and integration, formulating and promoting development cooperation activities and projects of a regional and sub-regional scope, and bringing a regional perspective to global problems and forums. In an era of greater needs but shrinking resources, ECLAC must address its considerable talents to assisting in the generation of resources that are targeted to the developmental needs of its membership. At a time when, de when the debate is about regulating rather than reforming the global financial architecture, ECLAC must demonstrate through scholarship and rigorous analysis that a broken system does not need regulation but reinvention if its core inequalities are to be addressed. And in a country where Fidel Castro proved that size or wealth or might does not guarantee victory in the battle of ideas, ECLAC must promote and defend economic ideas that benefit regional growth and development. To operate within the parameters of an ideological or economic structure that does not benefit your own region or peoples is to participate in your own underdevelopment. ECLAC, in its own way, must be in the vanguard of this battle of ideas to ensure that Latin America and the Caribbean economic thought helps to define rather than simply describe our developmental realities. Resources are finite. Capacity of the planet to withstand environmental assault is finite. However, the patience of this region's poor, marginalized, and vulnerable populations is in far shorter supply. As believers in and practitioners of multilateralism, our countries and institutions like ECLAC must invest in what is limitless, human ingenuity, power of innovation, and the wellspring of solidarity from which our greatest triumphs are born and nurtured now and into the future. Thank you for your attention.